Welcome back to Learn SKN and today we're going to continue looking at the May June 2017 Agricultural Science Single Award Paper 2 for CSEC. So Agricultural Science Paper 2 May June 2017 and we, we have completed number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and today we're going to continue looking at number 8 and so number 8 is another 12 point question. And so let's just jump right into that. But before we jump into it, of course, you know, what you have to do like the video, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell. So, you know, when Learn SKN drops another video. All right, good. So Farmer Samson uses a four wheel tractor to prepare land for cultivation of crops on his farm. Identify three pieces of personal protective clothing he should use when operating his tractor. OK, so you're operating the tractor. For one, the tractor is going to be a little loud, so you want to protect your ears. So you want to wear earmuffs or uh, put some st some st ear knobs in your ear or uh, some buds, whatever you want to call them, but protect your ear. So you have to wear some ear protection, ear pads, earmuffs, yeah, maybe the cock, ear cock, maybe the, you put some cotton in your ear, whatever. But, you know, you normally see them with the ear pads going through on the tractor, so that's one to protect your ear. Of course, you want to protect your hands from the constant turning of the wheel or the pulling or pushing of the, the gear stick or the lever or whatever your hand might get galled or blisters or whatever. So you want to wear some nice gloves. So you have to wear your gloves while operating the tractor. And of course, you want to wear your boots or maybe your steel toe shoes or whatever, some heavy duty shoes that can protect your feet when you're out you're in the tractor and you have to hit the clutch and the brake and all the other stuff when you operate in the tractor. So those are some protective gears you should wear. Of course, the one where you cover all or your overall, anytime you're doing any farm, farming activity, that's one uniform that farmers tend to use, the coverall or the overall to help them protect, to protect their undergarments as well as their skin from whatever the sun, the chemicals, what they're using. So that's another thing you want to use. And so those are just some um, protective gear. If you want to use a hard hat or, or, or some, car, some kind of cap on your head based on the nature of the tractor. Some tractors don't have any air conditioned cabins. Some are old school. So you're exposed to the sun. Of course, you want to wear something to protect your head from the sun. Or you want to wear some hard hat or something to protect your, uh, your head. So all those are protective clothing you can wear when operating a tractor and of course you may want to protect your eyes from the sun or from debris and so you want to wear a pair of goggles and that is another protective clothing part of clothing that you can wear when you're operating a tractor so those are a whole bunch i gave you let's say identify three and you're good to go all right b before we continue let's just look at the book and say so in the textbook you have you know, a farmer here in his boots, his glove, his coverall, overall, his goggles, his headgear. And they say here for a track team, it's one of your earmuffs to protect the loud uh, from loud noises, respirator and face mask protection from fume, smoke, dust. You want to wear your safety goggles or glasses, you wear your gloves, leather, fabric are disposable, boots, steel tipped with non skid soles, headgear, hard hat or helmet often with a face shield and clothing and coveralls that are tough, durable and fireproof. So all those you have are uh, gears. If you want a textbook answer right there for protecting yourself. All right, B. Farmer Samson sprays his okra crop with an insecticide to control an infestation of flea beetles. After spraying, he becomes ill and is diagnosed with insecticidal poisoning. Wow. So just two precautions each that farmer Samson should have observed during and after spraying to ensure the safe use of pesticides. All right, good. So during, of course, as uh, farmer Samson don't want to be eating, don't want to be smoking. He don't want to put, be putting his hand anywhere across his face, his eyes, his nose, his mouth. You don't want to do that. So during spraying, you don't want to do that at all. So that's one. During spraying, you have to ensure that your clothing isn't soaked with the chemicals. And if they are, you have to try and remove them, remove them as fast as possible. So during spraying, ensure that the clothing isn't soaked with the chemicals. Also during spraying, ensure that you wear your protective gear properly. 
Make sure you have on your respirator, everything properly. And so that would help you to prevent, that would prevent you from getting sick if, because you, you don't have any exposure. And, and then fourth, the fourth one, you have to be cognizant, you have to be aware of the direction in which the wind is blowing and also where you're spraying. So as not to get some of that stuff all in your face, you inhale them, things like that. You don't want that to be happening. So you have to be cognizant, you have to be observant of the wind direction and where you're standing when you're using the apparatus, whether it's a knapsack or spray can or whichever tool you might be using. After spraying now, again, fam, I want to take off his protective clothing as soon as possible, wash them nice. Also, you want to store the chemicals properly. You don't want to put them, label them, store them properly in a well-ventilated room. You don't want to store them in an area where the fumes are escaping and you're going and you do a big inhale and you're taking some of those fumes. You want to be ventilated and the package that they have been stored must be well-labeled and must be tightly secured. So all those things you, you have to do after. Also, of course, you have to triple rinse your, your container that you use with the chemical make sure you rinse that properly thoroughly so that you don't have any residue that might get on you and things like that so all those things are what you do after so you clean up yourself clean up the area dispose of the remnants properly you rinse the containers properly thoroughly triple triple rinse them make sure they are stored in a secure ventilated area so the fumes don't affect you and also make sure that they are labeled properly. So all those things are what Farmer Samson can take into consideration when storing, when looking after the, after spraying his crop. So that's four max. I gave you a whole lot to get just four max. Then we have C. A farmer observed the plant, the plant in one section of his tomato plot produced high yields of good quality fruit, while in another section the plant produced low yield and poor quality fruits. An extension officer visits the plot and states that the low yield and poor quality foods were due to weed infestation. And so they say, explain one way in which weeds could reduce the yield and quality of tomato fruits. Now, this is a very easy one. I'm supposed they only ask for one way, right? Just one way they ask for. And so in the textbook, they have a nice chapter, a nice paragraph dedicated to how weeds affect plants, crops, and can hamper the overall yield. So that's how they have here. Weeds compete with crops, crop plants for space in which to grow and for light, water, and nutrients. That's all you need to know right there. Because if the plant is not gaining enough nutrients, enough space to grow, enough light to carry photosynthesis, then of course the yields are going to be poor. If weed growth in a crop is heavy, then crop plants are deprived of, of, of their required requirements and the yield and quality of the produce will suffer. Weeds also contaminate crops, crop produce with their seeds and fruits. Some weed species act as a host for pests. They're a good one right there. Some they act as host for pests, such as aphids and disease-causing organisms. If weeds in a crop become infected, then disease-causing organisms can infect the crop plant and cause damage. Some weeds, for example, the redhead, are poisonous to livestock, especially cattle, horse, and mystery. So what they're saying is that the, the way in which weed affect the crop is that one, it competes with the crop for light, for space, for water, for nutrients. It also harbors certain pests and disease that can affect the crop negatively. So all so you chose any one of those and you'll get the answer for that one. It's explained one way. So you choose water requirement. You know that the, when you water your plant, the weed might take up more of the water than the plant would. So your plant doesn't have enough water to carry out their, their processes. Or for light, plant need light for photosynthesis. And so if the weed is towering over the plant or preventing them from getting enough light, then they cannot photosynthesize, make their own food, and so they're not going to be able to feed themselves. So you can go on and on about that one. Nutrients, you might need the, new, the, the NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, all that is needed from, for the crop to produce. And so if the weed is rubbing the crop of those val val valuable nutrients, then you know the yields are going to be poor. And of course, if they introduce certain negative, some certain negative pests, they would cause adverse effects on the overall yield of the tomato. So all those you can use to say why the weeds can affect the quality of the tomatoes. All right, D. 
Describe the features. Describe the features that will indicate when each of the following crops are ready for harvesting. And so, for these in particular, you have to describe the features that will indicate when each of the following crops are ready for harvesting. So you have tomato, sweet potato, cabbage. And so for the tomato in particular, now the tomato can be harvested. The best time to harvest the, the tomato is of course when it's mature. But the maturity of the tomato doesn't really always mean the color would be a certain way. So a uh, very red, red, red tomato doesn't mean that it hasn't matured. It might, it might be over mature, right? If you get my dress, my dress. So what we're saying is that for tomato, the best way to know when to harvest them is, well, two or three things. You have to know the length of time that the crop takes to grow. So you time that, and based on the, the, the timing, then you will know, okay, it's time for them to be harvested. That's one. But also, you can look at the color profile of the tomato. Now, based on where you're going to mark your, your tomatoes, you'll know when to pick them. Now, if you're going to sell them to a local supermarket, then may, maybe you want to pick them when they're a little more light red to reddish because between the farm to the market, they might get sold in time and whatnot. But sometimes you might want them for exporting purposes, and so you might want to pick them just as they mature. And so that is when the sepals or the calyx to the bottom start getting a little brown. That's when you know it's time to harvest your tomatoes. When the calyx or the sepals to the bottom start getting, not the bottom, to the top, sorry, to the top because the tomato opens downwards. So when it to the top and it start getting a little brown, that is when you know that the tomatoes are ready for harvesting. Again, you can use your eyes and your feel, and you can see the color based on what, when you want them to. Uh, um, to wait, 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 we want to market them. You know when to harvest them. You may want to harvest them a little greenish, reddish, light yellowish, so that by the time they reach the destination, they are fully ripened. Or you may want to harvest them after they would have matured. But the main thing is the leaf or the calyx you will see it start browning, start dying back, and that's when you know it's time to harvest them. As for sweet potatoes, a very similar thing. The timing would be important. You know, if the three, four months crop, you know, okay, time is about to come upon us when tomatoes, I mean, the sweet potatoes need harvesting, so you harvest them based on that timing. Or you look at the vines. Now, if the vines start dying back, they start turning yellowish, or they to the tips, or they start becoming a little brown, yellowish, then you know it's time to harvest the tubers so you look at the vine for that one also the cabbage now the head now the head of the cabbage they are very even within the same um crop you're gonna have different size heads of cabbage so you don't, you don't really depend too much on the head so what you depend on is the firmness of the head if you feel the cabbage and you realize it's a little firm it's all it's firm all around the head then you know it's time to harvest that cabbage but if you have some softness around then you might want to wait a little longer and then Wait until the head is nice and firm to harvest that cabbage. Okay, so number nine. Farmer Asher received two different bags of poultry feed with labels showing the, con the constituents of the feed. Uh, and table two shows exactly what's in the feed. So you have crude protein, 20% for A, 23% for B, crude fat, 2.5%, 4% for B, crude fiber, is 5% and 3% for feed B and minerals they have 1.3 to 1.6%. Alright, so they ask you know which of the two feed is better suited for broiler at week one to four of age. Give reasons for your answer. So broilers are the birds that are kept for their meat and week one to four basically so that's growing stage growing you want them to grow a lot, build the body mass because you want to butcher them as nice and plump as possible so now you have to look at which feed is best for that animal and based on what's going on here now the best one would be of course feed b where we say feed b they said this i give a reason to because as i said it's week one to four so you want the animal to be growing and developing their meat their muscle their fiber the tissues all those things and protein is used to build all of those things, build tissue. That's what protein is for. You know, when you go to the gym and you want to bulk up and, you know, pour on some mass, you drink your protein powder because you're building up, you're building your mass. So your protein is going to help the bird to get to that, that weight that you want them to as quick as possible. Also, the fat, the crude fat is going to be able to insulate the animal, help the animal to 
put on some more mass also and get it quicker to the weight that you want them to reach the minerals of course they're young just starting out and so they want the minerals to help them to be healthy and not catch certain diseases and things like that uh the fiber on the other hand you don't need as much fiber when it is young a young bird don't need as much fiber especially for the broiler in this case so the best feed is b and if for any reason you want to give is because of the level of crude protein content it's higher because that is what growing animals need to develop their tissue their muscles etc then b b asking us b part one what does the acronym fcr mean fcr one measly mark for that one fcr and so fcr stands for feed conversion ratio the feed conversion ratio one mark feed con not food feed conversion ratio you have it right in your textbook fcr feed conversion ratio and so the next question asking us write the formula for calculating feed conversion ratio what's the formula for that one so write the formula for calculating fcr and so the formula for calculating fcr is simply the feed the amount of feed in kilograms over the weight of the animal in kilograms so you're dividing the weight into the amount of feed that it took to reach that weight so that's how we get a formula for that one. And then they ask us here, they gave, gave, gave us a tip. They said, they said to calculate. So, so at Farmer Fazier's farm, a broiler bird that ate nine kilograms of feed weighed three kilograms. Calculate the FCR for this bird. Show our workings. And so this one very simple. So lay it down. You put the nine over the tree. Put the nine over the tree. And then you divide it. And you will get three because three into nine goes three times. So you get three kilograms. So the FCR for that one would be three to one. So the FCR for that one is three to one. How we get three to one? Nine divided by three equal three to one. Because it's nine kilograms of feed and the bird weigh weigh three kilograms. So you divide the three by the nine, you get three. And so it's a three to one ratio for the FCR. So it's only two marks because it's very easy. All right, number four, a research, not well, section four. A researcher conducts a study on the effects of feed on weight gain in boilers. The average FCR for each breed of boiler is presented in table three. So you have the crossover, the Peterfield, Tobago Brown. Which breed of broiler bird has the best FCR? Give one reason for your answer. And so the best answer here is, of course, the Tobago Brown, because the FCR is 3 to 1. And the reason why is that it's the lowest. It takes the Tobago Brown just 3 kilograms of feed to gain 1 kilogram of body mass. Whereas it takes the piece of field 4 kilograms of feed to gain the same 1 unit of body mass. And it takes across over 5 kilograms of feed to gain the same one unit of body mass. And so the one here, the, the bird that has the best FCR is the Tobago Brown. It's the lowest because it takes less feed to reach the same one kilogram increase in body weight. So that's two marks for that one. And the last one for this paper, the very last one for this paper, we have Farmer Shak Shaktai, Shaktai, I'm probably butchering the name, has a small ruminant farm. During the dry season, she experiences great difficulty sourcing good food, good quality forage for her animals. So there's three measures she can adopt during the rainy season to ensure that the small ruminants have food when the forage is unavailable. So what can she do? What can she do to make sure that they got food during the rainy season? And of course, there are a number of ways to conserve feed. And so you have three right here. You have three right here. There are three major forage conservation techniques. You have hay making, silage making, and deferred grazing. So they ask to list what they ask for. They ask to suggest. Right? So they suggest these three. And those will be the answer. So you suggest that the that the farmer cut some grass, put them to dry, so that when the rainy season comes around, they have enough grass in stockpile to give the animals to eat. So that's hay making. Then you have silage making, very similar, but you cut the grass when they're green 
and you put them to ferment. You put them under maybe a tarpaulin, a plastic, or in a silo to ferment. And at least when the rainy season comes around, the animals are going to have succulent feed to eat. They're almost going to be soft still, not going to be as dry as hay. The silage is not as dry as hay, it's more succulent. And so you can use that to feed the animals. And of course, you have deferred grazing where you basically keep a paddock just there. Don't let the animals graze on that paddock so that when the rain season comes, the animals, that, that paddock is still available for the animals to eat. Right? You can either put them out then when the rainy season comes around to eat. And so those are three ways to conserve uh, forage or to have forage when there's none available. So that's hay making, silage making, and deferred grazing. And the book outlines all of those. All right, so that's it for the May, June 2017 Agricultural Science Single Award Paper 2 for CISEC. The next time we're going to be looking at Pet 2018. So you know what to do. Like, subscribe, and hit the bell to know when Learn SKN drops 2018 for the Agricultural Science Single Award exam. All right, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening.